Joshua, the book of Joshua. An introduction to a book like this could be laborious. I don't, I don't want it to be laborious for you, but it may be a little bit more of a studious approach tonight. But knowing me, I have a hard time staying too studious. I end up getting into preacher mode. I, I want us to approach this book with a proper mindset and. So we're going to do some background reading, a number of, of scriptures along the way. Well, let's start with reading the first six verses, which seem to me to be introductory to the whole book. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. I feel myself drawn into that scripture and it affecting me at a very practical level, but I won't go there with with my words tonight, I'll just leave that in my thoughts and we'll touch that at another time. Uh, having been considering thoughts regarding sanctification, it does seem fitting that we're entering a study of the book of Joshua. I've been reading through this book and considering the background material uh, for this book for actually probably a couple of months or a month and a half, uh, preparing myself to be able to approach it in a way that again, won't be, it's not going to be a verse-by-verse -verse approach. It's, it, it, that would be a laborious way to approach this genre of Scripture. But I do want to approach it in a way that we glean from it what God intends for us today to have. We need to be impacted by the Word of God. It doesn't matter where we're reading, we need to be impacted by it. It's God's Word to us. I'm going to quote something here. This is a a, I don't recall where I got this information, but it's not mine, so I'm telling you that I'm quoting it, but I think it summarizes very well the book of Joshua. It's important to realize that Israel's, excuse me, this is the historical account, the book of Joshua, this is the historical account of Israel's possession of what was promised. We read that in the introductory verses there. This is what was said to Moses. So Joshua is being appointed to be the one to actually lead the children of Israel to receive what had been promised through Moses. Someone has properly observed, it is important to realize that Israel's ownership of the land was unconditional under the Abrahamic covenant. But possession of the land was conditional upon faith and obedience. And this person goes on to say, and so today, conflict and conquest by faith go with laying hold of that which we have positionally in Christ. The experience of our blessings in Christ comes through faith in the midst of conflict. And that really is the story of the book of Joshua. I believe that it was this morning where 
the thought came to my mind in prayer that there are, I think I said too many Canaanites in the land or something of that nature. And that really, that was coming from my, my study and preparations from Joshua. That there are too many enemies in the land that need to be driven out. And you can apply that personally. You can apply that uh, uh, culturally, ecclesiologically, plot it whatever level you want. Our responsibility as blood-bought children of God brought out of Egypt is to possess the land. And that's not done without a fight. And that really is the book of, of Joshua. The purpose of Joshua fits the overarching purpose of the whole Bible. It reveals to us the nature of God and his eternal purpose for his people worked out in real time. So what we're reading when we read through Joshua is real time history. It is God working out his purpose. Now, every detail of Joshua will not find an exact New Testament counterpart. And I don't think that it's wise for us to try to match detail for detail from Joshua to the New Testament. We probably will stumble into some error if we try to do that. But we will, as we work our way through Joshua, be looking for the timeless truths revealed as very graphic descriptions are given to us in this portion of God's dealing with his people in the world. And if you've read Joshua lately, you know there are some graphic scenes. Frankly, there are some difficult scenes in Joshua. And we're going to get to them very early in the book. And we'll try to explain the whys of certain things, such as the genocide that God commands in Joshua. Whole people groups, wipe them out. Everything that has to do with them, wipe them out. And we'll talk about that as we get into uh, the study of the book. The first six verses, it really is God's word to Joshua as he stands with, with Israel. If, you can, if you've seen it on the map at any point, but recently you can imagine the Jordan River uh, you've got the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, the Jordan River in Israel. is The nation of Israel is on the east side of the Jordan River. They're poised to cross over. Moses has, has led them to that point. In fact, Moses was, was allowed to see from a high a mountain top. He was able to see the land, but he wasn't able to go in. But this is where Joshua is now as he's receiving this word in the first six verses from the Lord God himself, waiting for the green light to cross over and, and possess what God has already promised. Moses' ministry was a preparation ministry. The nation of Israel was prepared by Moses for this day, for entry into this land that was promised to them. You know that he was raised up miraculously by Jehovah God to lead Israel out of Egypt. We'll not recount that story. It's familiar enough to where probably most of you know it already. But what should have been a straight shot to Canaan, and I forget exactly how long it would have taken had they just simply set out on their journey and done what God said. Maybe somebody remembers that, but I failed to to refresh my memory on that, but it ended up taking them 40 years to get just to the, just to the entrance into the, into the land of Canaan. And then it took another probably nearly 20 years to actually possess the land. They wandered around in the wilderness as a generation of unbelievers. In fact, let's go back to Numbers chapter 14. And really, it was a, a generation of unbelievers that wandered around while a generation of at least potential believers were raised up. The unbelievers died off. They didn't believe God. And they did not enter the land. Hebrews talks about that, you remember, Hebrews chapter 3. But in Numbers chapter 14, this is when the spies came back 
from the report. Ten of them gave a horrific report and so frightened the people and unbelief prevailed. Two spies gave a good report. Joshua was one of those. And they didn't prevail. The children of Israel, verse 33, the result of that, your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which you search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall you bear your iniquities even 40 years, and you shall know my breach of promise. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there they shall die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. Through Moses, God prepared his nation as they wandered around. Of course, the, the law was given at Sinai, but over the next 40 years, Moses had opportunity to, to go over the law again. Deuteronomy, for example, is just kind of like a second giving of the law, reiteration of the law. And during that 40 years, the law was taught to the people of God that wandered in the wilderness, preparing them to go into the promised land. Uh, a guide to them. The promise of blessing was given actually through the law as well. A covenant was made with Israel. And so long as they remain true to God's law, then they received the blessings of the covenant. That was, those were the conditions of the co covenant that was given to them through Moses. You can turn to Exodus chapter 23. This is at Sinai. And this was, it's interesting, the promise that is communicated here. Remember, the promise was given, the land promise actually was given to Abraham and his seed. But it was given also through Moses in Exodus 23 and verse 20. Begin reading here, we'll read through verse 33. Behold, I sent an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I had prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. For mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee. One thing, keep, it, keep in mind as we read here, the significance of obedience to possessing the promises. And... And, and while all of the promises are, that we have are our yea and amen in Jesus Christ, still in this new covenant age, obedience is connected to receiving promises in this age in which we live. And we can demonstrate that from the New Testament. And so he says, For mine angel shall go before thee, and bring thee in unto the Amorites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them and quite break down their images. And you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in, the, in, the, in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. I will send my fear before thee, and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come." And I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee. And I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite and the Canaanite and the Hittite from before thee. I will not drive them out from before thee in one year. Can you hear the progression here? It won't do it in one year. It's not going to happen immediately. And that's the picture that Joshua gives to us lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field multiply against thee. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. 
And I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea, even to the Sea of the Philistines, and from the desert unto the river. And I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and thou shalt drive them out before thee. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in thy land, lest they make thee sin against me. For if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto thee. And so the promise of land and the blessings that would come from their entry into the land are communicated at Sinai before the expression of unbelief. At this point, Israel had not expressed themselves in their unbelief. That, that comes later. But this is the promise under Moses to the nation of Israel. And then you have, I want to read one other lengthy passage. This will be the last lengthy passage that I read in Numbers chapter 33. You have in this passage a summary of Moses to the nation as they were poised on the west of Jordan. And I read this because our passage in Joshua chapter 1 says this is what's happening. God says, as I, as I spoke to Moses, as I communicated to him what I said to him, I am now appointing you as the one to carry it out, to do it. And these are the things that were said to Moses and through Moses to the people Numbers 33, beginning at verse 50. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho. So there they are. They're, they're poised. They're on the east side of Jordan, ready to go. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images and quite pluck down all their high places. And you shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it. And you shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families, and to the, and the, and to the more you shall give the more inheritance, and to the fewer you shall give the less inheritance. Every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falls. According to the tribes of your fathers you shall inherit. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein you shall dwell. By the way, just insert a thought here. You ever wondered why some of us as Christians have such difficulty, continual, perpetual difficulties. Is it perhaps that we have allowed some things to remain in our lives that shouldn't remain there? And they constantly create problems for us. I mean, you go to the New Testament and Jesus uses some pretty harsh language. If your, if your hands offend you, what are you supposed to do? If your eye offends you, what are you supposed to do? You know, we read language like we hear in the Old Testament. We think, oh, that's awful. That's harsh Old Testament language. You go to the New Testament. Sin is an awful thing. We don't see it that way. We toy around with it. We play around with it. We're friendly with it. It's not really that bad. It hasn't hurt us that much. So we think. And so we allow it to live. And when you allow it to live in your life, I guarantee you, it will prick you. It will poke you. It will call, it will vex you. It'll cause trouble for you. I mean, I know I'm jumping to the punchline here, but do, do you, do you get that? Do you, do you do battle with sin like it's a problem? Or do you allow it to live? Moreover, it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you as I thought to do unto them. And the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall unto you for an inheritance, even the land of Canaan with the coast thereof. Then your south quarter shall be from the wilderness of Zin along by the coast of Edom. Your south border shall be the outmost coast of the salt sea eastward. And your border shall turn from the south to the ascent of Acrobam and pass on to Zin. And the going forth thereof shall be from the south of Kadesh Barnea, and shall go on to Hazar Adar, and pass on to Asmon. And the border shall fetch a compass from Asmon, Asmon unto the river of Egypt, and the goings out of it shall be at the sea. And as for the western border, you shall even 
have the great sea for a border. This shall be your west border. That's the Mediterranean. And this shall be your north border. From the great sea you shall point out for you Mount Hor. By the way, that you, you hear the Hittites? The Hittites were in the northern region. That's the area that he's referring to here. A, if you look on a map, a Bible map, you'll see the region of the Hittites in the north. God promised them that land. From Mount Hor you shall point out your border unto the entrance of Hamath, and the goings forth of the border shall be to Zedad. And the border shall go on to Ziphron, and the goings out of it shall be at Hazar Enan. This shall be your north border. And, I mean, think about it. You're standing there, and you don't own any land. I mean, you haven't possessed anything. And here, Moses is saying, God is saying to Moses, Moses is saying to the people, listen, this is what I have in store for you. And they haven't possessed anything yet. This is just a promise. You know God's given us a lot of promises, and some of those we haven't possessed yet. And the coast shall go down from Shepham to Riblah on the east side of Ain. And the border shall descend and shall reach into the side of the sea of Chinnereth eastward. And the border shall go down to about this time. Some of the women are thinking, what am I going to cook for dinner? You know, you know, the men are, wow, yeah, that's, yeah, I, yeah, I can, you know, picture that, you know, and, and. I mean, this was the nation hearing this, just like you're sitting there thinking. But these were the details. And God is promising. And the border shall go down to Jordan, and the goings out of it shall be at the salt sea. This shall be your land with the coast thereof round, round about. And Moses commanded the children of Israel, saying, This is the land which you shall inherit by lot, which the Lord commanded to give unto the nine tribes and to the half-tribe. For the tribe of Reuben, according to the house of their fathers, and the tribe of the children of Gad, according to the house of their fathers, have received their inheritance. And half the tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance. So Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh had already received their inheritance on the east side of Jordan. But remember, in another place, Moses says, but you are going to have to send your men across to help possess the land on the west side of, of Jordan. And God protected their families while they stayed behind and they went in. The Bible says they did it. We'll see that in Joshua. They did exactly that. And then Joshua exhorts them in relationship to going back to their land. And then they, you remember, they built an altar. And we'll get to that in Joshua. And there was a problem with all of that. The two tribes and the half-tribe have received their inheritance on this side of Jordan, near Jericho, eastward toward the sun rising. And the, Lord said to, and the Lord spake to Moses, saying, These are the names of the men which shall divide the land unto you, Eleazar the priest, and Joshua the son of Nun. So what we're... What we're Summarizing here is the principle set forth in the New Testament. It is God that works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. It is the Lord God that leads and gives the victories. I mean, if you were standing there listening to this, and I mean, this was not a seasoned, trained military group of, of people. How were they going to accomplish what God is saying they were going to accomplish? It wasn't going to be, going to be because of them. It was going to be because of who the Lord God is. He would lead them, and Joshua would be his chosen servant to lead the nation. And so it is with us. We must engage the enemy, and we must fight the fight of faith if we are going to have the victories that God has promised to us, just like Joshua and the children of Israel. Well, Moses was all, not only was Moses instrumental in preparing the nation, all of this was going on. Moses was preparing the nation for something he wasn't going to enjoy but he was the man that prepared them there's a message there probably but he also was instrumental in preparing joshua for this day moses dies at 120 years old this is given to us in deuteronomy 34 and verse 7 moses was 120 years old when he died his eye was not dim nor his natural force abated he was full of strength, in other words. And I find that interesting. He was 120 years old, but he was full of... In other words, he didn't drop dead because his heart gave out by old age or he, he, he could barely move and it was time to pass the torch. 
What that says to me is the timing of Joshua's leadership was ordained by God. Moses was done and it was Joshua's time to take over. It was Joshua's appointed time. He was probably about 90 years old. He lived 110 years old. So about 20 years. He leads the nation of Israel across the Jordan. Joshua. He was quite a man, really. Let's talk about him for a few minutes. He's called the son of Nun, N-U-N. He's of the tribe of Ephraim. He's called the son of Nun, I think, because all the men or women in the Old Testament are not, their, their parental heritage is not necessarily always given, but almost always it's Joshua the son of Nun. Joshua the son of Nun. And I think that's because there is another Joshua in Scripture. And it is Joshua the son of Josedek. Remember him? You find him in the post-exilic days of Haggai and Zechariah. Very significant figure. In fact, he was a priest. Representative of Christ. But this is Joshua the son of Nun. His birth name was Osha or Osea, Hosea. Hosea is a translation of the very same Hebrew word of Osha, O-S-H-E-A. And that was his given name. It means deliverer or salvation. But it was changed by Moses to Jehoshua in Numbers 13 and verse 16 when the 12 spies were chosen Joshua was one of those 12 spies. And verse 16 says, And Moses called Oshia, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. What does Jehoshua mean? It means Jehovah delivers. Hosea, or Oshia, says, means deliverer or salvation. But there is no identification of who the, the, the deliverer is, who the Savior is. Jehoshua refers to Jehovah. Jehovah is the deliverer. Jehovah is the Savior. I think Moses had God-given insight. I think he had God-given insight into Joshua's role in Israel, which is one of the reasons why he puts so much, he trains him, he, he mentors him, and we'll see that. But I think he has further insight than that. I think it's possible that Moses even saw that Joshua was a foreshadowing of another Joshua. Now, who is that other Joshua? They shall call his name Joshua, Jesus, Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. It is interesting twice in the New Testament where we would anticipate Joshua. The King James translators translated it Jesus. Twice. Once in Galatians, I think it is, and once in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 8. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterwards have spoken of another day? The modern translations translate that Joshua, but it is the name Jesus, Jesus. There remaineth therefore a rest of the people of God. That connects the New Testament Jesus with the Old Testament Joshua. Which Brandon may help, may, if I'd have thought about that, would have helped us out with the conversation with that lady who was wrangling over names out on the streets recently. See, Jesus is the Greek counterpart to the Hebrew Jehoshua. And Savior is... The name Savior in the New Testament describes who he is. In other words, he is Hosea, who is Jehoshua. He is the Savior, but he's Jehovah's Savior. And in the New Testament, you have those two names put together for more than one place, but I'll give you an example in Acts chapter 13 and verse 32. I'm telling you this because... You need to be drawing a connection in your mind, at least to some degree. Not, not, not experience for experience, not detail for detail, 
But there is a comparison between the Joshua of the Old Testament and Jehoshua of the New Testament, Jesus of the New Testament. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 23, of this man's seed, talking about David, of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus, Jehoshua. Jesus is the Greek counterpart to the Hebrew word Jehoshua. Now that's significant. So, so those who would those who would argue against the use of the name Jesus and say that it's the son of Zeus, wasn't that what it was? Somebody told us recently that Jesus is a Greek name that means the son of Zeus. No, Jesus is the Greek counterpart to Jehoshua, which means Jehovah is salvation. He's the deliverer. That's who Joshua is. That's who Jesus is. And that's who Joshua represents. He was handpicked by Moses as his servant and his military leader. He's first mentioned in Exodus chapter 17. If you want to go back there. Exodus 17. You remember the battle with the Amalekites? You remember that was the battle where Moses lifted his arms. And, and you know who was in the valley fighting, leading the, the army? It was Joshua. And so as Moses' arms were lifted, Joshua would win. As his arms went down, they would be defeated. And so it was necessary that his arm, their, their arms be lifted up. And so we have that New Testament reference about lifting holy hands in prayer. And I think maybe the implication there isn't praying with your hands lifted up, but you have the responsibility of, through prayer, lifting up, keeping the hands of God's servants up in prayer. You can think on that one. See if I'm right on that. If I'm, not, if I'm not right on that, at least it's a good thing to pray for your leaders so that they can keep their hands lifted in the work God has given them to do. But it says, Moses said to Joshua in verse 9, Exodus 79, Choose out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. And Joshua did as Moses said and fought with Amalek. And as you continue through the book of Exodus, when you come to Mount Sinai, you see Joshua is with Moses. He's somewhere, it appears, on the mount with, he's not at the top of the mount, but he's somewhere on the mountain with Moses. He's close to him. He's his understudy. And you, and you see him again in the tabernacle when the glory of God comes upon the tabernacle. It says Joshua remained in Exodus 33, I think it is. He remained in the tabernacle. So he's close to Moses. He's being, he's being developed, he's being trained by, by Moses. And I, I think there's symbolism here. And y'all can pick this apart if you want to, but I, I do think there is symbolism here. The law and the gospel are not at odds with one another. Moses and Joshua are not at odds with one another. Isn't that true? They're not at odds. The fact of the matter is Joshua is fulfilling what Moses said. That's the picture that's given to us in the Old Testament. I see that as symbolical. Moses leads to Joshua. And Joshua fulfills Moses. And in fact, Joshua never discounts Moses. Jesus never did. Joshua never does. In fact, in verse 7, in Joshua 1, only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. And throughout the book you see Joshua making reference back to what Moses commanded, what Moses said. But Moses could not lead the people to the land of promise. And the law can't do that for you or for me. He can't deliver. The law cannot deliver. The law condemns. Moses dies. That's what happens under the law. Death. And it's not that the law is bad. There's nothing wrong with the law. There's something wrong with us. And the law exposes that. Sorry, I'm launching off into a little preaching here, but... Joshua delivers. 
And if you're following Joshua, if you're following the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be led through the obedience of faith. And by the obedience of faith, you are going to live victoriously following Joshua. He will lead you to victory. Jesus Christ will. Deuteronomy chapter 1 kind of summarizes what I'm saying here in, in Old Testament language. Deuteronomy 1, 37 and 38, also the Lord was angry, Moses says. He was angry with me for your sake, saying, Thou also shall not go in hither, but Joshua, the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither, encourage him. For he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Our inheritance is sure in Jesus Christ, our Joshua. The man Joshua was full of faith. I love this about Joshua. In Numbers chapter 14, you see this when, the, when they came back from the from the land of Canaan with their report while the ten spies were overwhelmed by what faced them. There is no way we can take that land. There is no way I can overcome this sin. There is no way I can live victoriously. That, that's, that's what a lot of folks say. And unbelief sets in, doesn't it? But here you have Joshua and Caleb Coming with a different report in Numbers 14, verses 6 through 9, Jehosh and Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. They were upset at the report, at the response, really, the reaction of the children of Israel who were believing the ten spies, the, the other ten spies. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we, pos which we pass through to search, it's an exceeding good land. It's as if they didn't see the, the, the enemy. It's as if they didn't see how strong the opposition was. They had, their, they had their minds upon the promise. I believe they had their minds upon the one who's promising, Jehovah God. If the Lord... Delight in us. Then he will bring us into this land and give it us. Do you hear the spirit of faith there? A land which flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land. For they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Doesn't that encourage you? Translate that to your life today. Translate that to your battle, to your struggle today. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. We're going to run into opposition. Even from those who say they're our brethren. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. But Joshua was full of faith. He was full of the spirit of wisdom in Deuteronomy, more than one place, but in Deuteronomy 34, excuse me, yes, Deuteronomy 34, verse 9, Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. He was strong and courageous in his leadership under Jehovah. The Lord God, verse 6 of Joshua 1, The Lord God said, Be strong and of, a, and of a good courage. And that's exactly what Moses had said to Joshua more than once. And he said it also to the other spies when they went into the land. Be strong, be, a, be of good courage. Joshua and Caleb heard it. They believed. And a couple of times later, that this exhortation was repeated to Joshua by Moses. Be strong and of a good courage. And he was. That was his character. By the way, that's necessary in leadership. 
And those that God uses today in leadership in the church and in his kingdom are men and women who have this kind of character about them. I mean, you remember that was even said of those that were picked out as deacons in, in Acts chapter 6. They were men that were full of the Holy Spirit and they had wisdom. Remember that? Full of wisdom. The spirit of wisdom was upon them. Strong and courageous. They were able to keep going, not because of any strength and courage necessarily in themselves, as with the Apostle Paul, we would say we're weak in ourselves, but it's because our confidence is in the living God. We move forward. We press on. Looking to Him, trusting in Him. And if we can translate this to leadership today, there are those that God calls to be those kinds of leaders and you are called upon to follow. To be like them as they set the example for you. As we take the land, as we take what God has promised to us. Well, he is, Joshua is God's choice to succeed Moses. I say he is God's choice. He, he's, not, he's not just Moses' choice. I, I won't, for sake of time, read it, but Numbers 27, 18 through 23, you can see Eliezer, Moses, they, hands were laid upon Joshua. He was ordained to be the, the next leader. And then in the first six verses of Joshua, you hear it, don't you? As the Lord says, you're my choice. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake to Joshua, the son of Nun. He spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun. Moses, minister, saying, Moses, you see that Moses, Joshua was Moses' minister. He was his servant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Do, do you sense the, the faith that was required in Joshua at this point as he stood there with this multitude of people? who he had already seen weren't easy to lead. They had, they had shown themselves. And he is placed in that position of leadership. And I can only imagine that there must, must have been just a few thoughts of apprehension running through Joshua's mind. And so God is speaking to him. I'm going to tell you, God has to speak to his leaders. If God didn't speak to his leaders... And I'm not talking through an audible voice, but He does speak to us. His Spirit is in us. And He speaks to us through His Word. But it is a, it is a real voice of God to His leaders and to His people. But He must speak to us to sustain us. Or we will fall. We will falter. We will give in. We will not be the leaders that we should be. So Joshua listens to the Lord. And he confirms directly with Joshua the things that he had spoken to Moses. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. I mean, you think about this. First thing they're going to encounter when they cross that river, as far as a battle goes, is, is Jericho. And the battle strategy, you know, walk around. I mean, that's a familiar story. But you've got you to believe God to do that. <laughs> I mean, you've got, you got to have some confidence in God to do what God says. Are you hearing me? You have to have some confidence in God to do what He says. Even if you don't, even if it seems wacky. I mean, in my mind, that seems, that's a, a military strategy? That seemed wild. But he led them. Because he heard God say, not any man, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of thy life. But then what happened shortly after that? Ai. So something went wrong 
And we're gonna, we'll get into that. And he knew something went wrong because Joshua remembered the promise. He remembered what God said. And it had to affect him. Something is desperately wrong here. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Even when things go wrong, God's not failing us or forsaking us. Something's wrong. But it ain't God. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear to their fathers to give them. And so Joshua is God's choice to succeed Moses. The thought was placed in my, into my mind that perhaps this is the prophet. You remember, you remember back in Deuteronomy 18, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him you shall hearken. Who's that talking about? Is it possible that Joshua is the prophet that's being talked about there? Immediately. I know ultimately it points to Christ. I know that. But could there be a more immediate fulfillment of that? According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord the, uh, the, my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. And the Lord said, They have spoken, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. That sounds like Joshua. The first Joshua. Oh, it's also the, the Joshua to come. Joshua, the Lord Jesus. But I'm thinking that that might be fulfilled in the Joshua that we're looking at here. Let me just briefly say a few things about the book so that we don't spend too much time here this evening on this. The nature of the book is historical, but not details of history simply for the sake of knowing. And this is important for us when we're reading the Bible. The details included communicate truth that God wants known about himself. That's important. Do not try to cover up the word of God. The famed atheist over there in England, you know, the one that, what's his name? The the one that's still living that writes all the popular books and what is it? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody, he said he would like to put a, a Bible into the hands of every child in England. And when I heard that, he was saying, but so that they would read Joshua, they would read books like this and see what this God is really like. And I say, absolutely put it in their hands. Let them see what this God is like. This is what God is like. I, what I'm saying to you is, don't back away. Don't try to hide this. Don't try to conceal this. Don't try to say to people, well, don't, don't be afraid that they're going to read the Old Testament. Fact of the matter is, I don't know that I'll ever baptize a person again unless they do read the Old Testament. Sorry if I get a little animated there on that one. but Because unless you can read the Old Testament and say, that's the God that I bow before. That's the God that I know. That's the God that I serve. You don't know God. And once the light comes on, that is, once you read that, you're going to be so alarmed, you're going to deny whatever faith you professed. Because you haven't professed the true and the living God. Does that make sense? And I, I think it's important. God, God didn't intend for this to be concealed. He didn't have to record it. It could have been history that was buried under the dust of the ancient archives. But it's not. We have the record of it. But I will also say that it needs to be understood in the light of all of Scripture. Otherwise, we will be understanding God in a way that he does not intend himself to be understood. So that's important as well. We'll try to talk about that more when we get to some of those sections in the book. Chapters 1 through 5 deal with Israel's preparation under Joshua to begin the conquest. You know, you don't just march into the conquest. There has to be some preparation. And there is some preparation that's done before they actually, the spies are sent in. There's, you know, there's, there's some, 
there's some work, there's some preparation work that has to be done. One of the most you know, shocking, misunderstood, probably difficult chapters in the book of Joshua would be chapter 5. And, uh, and y'all can race to it later on and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Uncomfortable, like, oh boy, how do we deal with that? We're going to deal with it. It's the Word of God. And we don't need to run from it. Something is being said. That's part of the preparation. They were unprepared to enter into battle because they had not fulfilled the terms of the covenant. And there, I gave you the, the key, I think, that unlocks that chapter a little bit. There's more to it than that. We'll get, talk about that when we get to it. Chapters 6 through 12, 12 deal, deal with the actual conquest of the promised land. The word possession is used, what is it, I don't know, 25 times, a lot of times in the book of Joshua. And that's what's going on, the possession of the land. Chapters 13 to 22 belabors, and I use the word belabor because sometimes people skip over those chapters, most of those chapters, because it's just kind of like really just monotonous talking about the distribution of the land, you know, from this point to this point and that point, and that, you know, and it's like, whoo, boy, there's nothing spiritual there, is there? Well, we'll see. Maybe there's more there than what we have uncovered. We'll try not to make it a belaboring task to go through those chapters, but that's what chapters 13 through 22, 21, 22 talk about. 23 and 24 is the record of Joshua's final message to Israel, some very powerful portions in those last two chapters that, in the confirmation of the covenant. Remember that the history is real. The history of Joshua that you're reading is real which includes graphic scenes of intense conflict and brutal annihilation of people groups in the land of Canaan, which causes struggles to our, to our minds. We'll, we'll deal with those, as I've already said. But what transpires under Joshua's leadership is precisely what God foretold in Deuteronomy chapter 7. And you have these kinds of passages as you read through the books of Moses. Um, you have passages, I've already read a couple of them, but in Deuteronomy 7 and verses 1 through 5, I'm not going to read that just for sake of time, you can read it, but it's sort of summarizing what would take place as they came into the land, the different people groups that were going to be dealt with and, and so forth. The promise of God is, is being fulfilled. The possession of the land was in fact the owner of the land. Who owned the land? Who, who owned Canaan? Who, whose land was that? Who, whose land was Canaan, the land of Canaan? Canaanites? It's a little trick question, David. Thank you for... <laughs> but in a certain sense, yes. But in, a, in the, the truest sense, no. It was Jehovah God's land. He owned it. He owns the earth. It's his. When he says the meek shall inherit the earth, what you have in Joshua is just sort of a microcosm of what's coming. And the land of Canaan is just a, it's just a really, really tiny piece of land. We've been promised the earth. All of it. You've heard of the new heaven and the new earth? It's ours. And Joshua is going to lead us into the possession of the new earth. And that's one of the things that I think you can, you can at least picture as you work your way through the book of, of Joshua. It is the fulfilling of the covenant promise to Abraham and his descendants. Abraham never received it. Hebrews talks about that. He received it by faith, but he never saw it, did he? Never, he never received the land, but he will. He will. He will be on the new earth with us, Abraham. That's kind of exciting to think about. It's the fulfillment of Genesis 15, 18. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Numbers 34, 2. Command the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land of Canaan, when you come into the land of Canaan, not if, when you come into the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall unto you for an inheritance, even the land of Canaan with the coasts thereof. 
Broadly speaking, and I've already hinted at this, but broadly speaking, Joshua presents a picture of progressive sanctification, taking possession of all that has been promised us under the leadership of our Joshua, Jesus Christ. We have a rest in him. We have it now. We have it forever. That's what Hebrews 4 talks about. What you read about Joshua here was not the final rest. Our rest is in Christ. And that's what Hebrews 4 says. To. That's why we can go back to Joshua and we can see Joshua as a type of Jesus Christ. We have the New Testament authority to do that. We just need to be careful that we're not trying to match detail for detail because that's where we could possibly stumble. Um, I've got one final paragraph here to read. It's from someone else, Ralph Davis, who does a really great job of commenting on Old Testament books. But before I do that, who wrote the book of Joshua? Anybody know? I know, David, you're not going to say, right? <laughs> but you would be right if you said what you're thinking. I think, I, if, you, if you're thinking Joshua, uh, it probably was Joshua that wrote it. Uh, not all of it. Uh, because his death is talked about, and, and uh, you know, so somebody else, maybe um, Eliezer, maybe the priest, uh, we, we don't know for sure, but we do have a reference in, in chapter 24, in verse 26. Apparently, uh, the book of Joshua is so linked to the books of Moses, to the books of the law, that it seems to be somewhat included as an extension or part of the, the law of God. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, Joshua 24, 26, and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. So while we, I would conclude that Joshua didn't write everything in the book of Joshua. He is the primary writer of the book. Let me close with this quote by Ralph Davis. The book of Joshua is preaching material beamed to Israel in the form of historical narrative. And that's important because there are a lot of critical commentaries, and I have some of them, and Ralph Davis would say, and by the way, he is not, he's, a, he's an acad academician. I mean, he, he's, a, he's got the doctorates by his name. So he's no, he's not me. I mean, he's well, well, well studied. But what he would say is most of the commentaries, especially the critical ones, are so dry and dusty that they bring nothing to the people of God. And that is not the purpose of the Word of God. The purpose of the Word of God is not to investigate every detail and analyze every nuance and background material and archaeological finds and word twists and turns and so forth to where when you get done, all you have is a headache from your reading and your study. The purpose of the Word of God is to communicate. God is communicating. And Ralph Davis understands that. We need to see clearly that History in the Old Testament is a declaration from God about God. As you read and study Joshua, try to keep asking yourself the question, what is the writer preaching about when he tells me this story? Did you hear that? What is the writer preaching about when he tells me this story? He's not telling you the story only to inform you, although that's part of it. He has a message to proclaim, a God to press upon you. I like that. So I hope as we work our way through Joshua, I'm going to try to keep that in mind. You try to keep that in mind. And let's go through it together with benefit. I trust God will teach us more about himself and perhaps even aid us in our warfare against sin in our own lives and in our generation. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that you have given us tonight to introduce a portion of your word.